Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. <laughs> Welcome to the Parasite Podcast. I'm Sherry. And I'm Marie. And today we're going to cover part two of the Peter Zimmer or you might think of him as Joe Van Collier's story. If you like this podcast, please follow us on your favorite podcast platform and leave us an Apple review. Thank you. If you haven't listened to part one, go do that right now. This story is pretty complicated. We haven't even covered Peter's Texas stocking adventure yet. Oof. Well, we'd better get started. <laughs> yeah. Peter never denied committing the murders before he entered the juvenile justice system, and he also never expressed remorse. In our previous episode, Anarchy 101, we talked about the Wisconsin Children's Code in depth. The authorities wanted Peter to face charges in adult court for this crime. All officers and investigators connected to that case say Peter was very collected and cool right from the moment they met him. But at the time of the murders, 14-year-old Peter could only be charged and tried under Wisconsin's juvenile laws. He was too young at age 14 to be waived into the adult courts because remember that was 16 at the time. Mm -hmm. Peter pled no contest to the petition for delinquency. He was adjudicated delinquent in the murders of all three of his family members. Well, he's lucky he wasn't old enough because this was clearly premeditated. He would have gotten first degree. So that's a really sophisticated murder for a 14-year-old. He killed three people successfully, and then he wasn't even flustered. He just kind of headed out to do what he wanted to do. When he was questioned by that clerk, he had a pretty good lie put together. Oh, he'd adopted the story of the hitchhiker. This is a pretty smooth 14-year-old. When you think about the degree of lying he was committing mm -hmm. and, and how smooth he was. Oh, no, I'm just a hitchhiker. Just kind of absorbing other people's stories and using them. Yeah, pretty easily. And then he was all calm and cool when the police showed up to say, Hey, we noticed that you murdered your family. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah. I don't understand how he could be so cool. Yeah. Anyway, how is the juvenile court different from adult court? I don't think we've ever talked about that. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the theory behind it in our last episode, but there are a few key differences. So one of the things is that juveniles do not have a constitutional right to trial. So in juvenile court, there are no trials. There are only adjudication hearings, and there is no jury. The hearing is decided by the judge who presides over the hearing of the petition for delinquency. These judges are specialized in the laws and rules that govern juveniles. So all of the words are different. You don't use trial, you don't have a jury, you don't use guilty, all of that. Yeah, so there's no verdict, there's just an adjudication. Okay. Um, and then one of the kind of annoying things for a researcher is that although trials in adult court are public, adjudication hearings are private. Why? Well, the philosophy, and it makes sense in certain contexts, but the idea is that minors can't commit serious crimes, so privacy is afforded to the child so that their reputations are not destroyed before they can get a start in life. Oh, so it's kind of that these children are young people who can be easily molded into having a better life? Yeah, it's just this idea that they need to turn 18 and be able to go and, you know, get jobs and go to school without people judging them for shoplifting or whatever they did as mm. a child. Okay. Yeah. So the shroud of privacy here allowed the child to get back on the right track before reaching adulthood after screwing up. And one of the ways they would do that was reform school. But these lawmakers did not take the commission of really serious crimes such as murder into consideration when drafting these laws. And they amended them later. And then when we're talking about guilty verdicts, there is no such thing in juvenile court. As a guilty verdict? Yeah, it's not guilty and there's no verdict. It's an adjudication of responsibility, 
committing a delinquent act or being delinquent, depending on the state. And it's semantics meant to remind everyone of the goals of the juvenile system. Both responsible and delinquent mean pretty much the same as guilty. It's the belief of the court that the child did the thing that they're accused of, and that if they were standing in adult court, the verdict would have been guilty. This is a nod to an important difference between the two types of courts. In adult court, a guilty verdict means guilty of a crime, and it leads to going to prison and punishment. And as philosophies change in criminal law, sometimes eventual rehabilitation. Mm. But in juvenile court, the end goal is not to punish the child, it is purely rehabilitation. Because minors can't commit crimes, they commit delinquent acts. And also, these kids are not detained in adult prison. That would be horribly unsafe. They're most typically in group homes, juvenile lockup, and sometimes even skilled foster care homes. Oh, so what's coming up is probate court. And all of these differences in words really tangles up probate court. So what else is different? Anything else? Well, just a couple more things. So minors who are in the juvenile system age out of that system eventually. They are not detained in the juvenile justice system once they reach the age of majority. Mm. And this age varies based on state law, but it's generally but it is generally 18 or 21 years old. So there is in effect a magical day of release regardless of what the minor does while in the juvenile system, which is one of the problems that's been identified and why there are blended sentences now. So we're talking Mm -hmm. about how it was at this time. But now there are blended sentences where the child might be in the juvenile system, and if they don't do well, then they can end up in the adult system. But at this time, there was no blended sentence. It was just, you go through the juvenile system, and at 18, we hope you're ready because it's time to go. Oh, okay. That makes a lot of sense. The blended sentencing is fairly new. It is. And I think it was a good idea. I think it's very wise. And then one more thing about privacy is that delinquent acts committed by minors are sealed. Because the best interests of the child are taken into serious consideration, anything that happens in juvie is supposed to stay in juvie. Like Vegas. Yeah, like Vegas. The records are automatically expunged, which does not mean deleted. It just means more hidden from public view, more than erased. Mm -hmm. So potential employers and landlords can't see it. And this is so that the child will be, at least theoretically, on equal footing with same-age contemporaries at the age of 18 as they set out into their adult lives. That makes a lot of sense when you're looking at a child who has committed a smaller crime than murder, I think. Yeah, I mean, if it's a kid who vandalizes things and is just going through a rough time, it's really nice to have a chance to turn it around before they're an adult. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So did Peter do well in the juvenile system? It depends on what you mean by doing well. I don't think that he really took the rehabilitation part seriously, Mm -hmm. but he did make some moves that were, again, very sophisticated for a 14-year-old. Oh, okay. Like what? Well, while in the juvenile system, Peter was required to participate in counseling and therapy. That makes sense. Yeah, and it probably would have been good for him, but he refused. What? Yeah, he knew there was nothing they could do about it. He was getting out when he was 18, regardless of what he did in juvie. Most 14-year-olds are much more compliant than that. Yeah, and they think they need to follow the rules in order to get what they want. Mm -hmm. He was pretty clear on the fact that he didn't need to. And that he knew that is pretty big. Yeah. It adds to this idea that he had really checked out what was going to happen to him if he got caught. Mm. He spent most of his time in reform school reading everything he could get his hands on and corresponding with friends from both Illinois and Wisconsin. And he also planned for the day he would be released from custody. He'd figured out how to fund his new life after release. What? Well, he declared his intent to claim the $370,000 in his family's estate as the sole surviving heir of the parents he had murdered. This almost sounds like an adult. It does. It's really strange to me. Based on the story, I kind of expected him to come out of the juvenile system and have some adult that had been coaching him, but there wasn't any that we could see. Um, He filed before he even left the reform school. So he was under 18, and he may have looked into this 
money scheme before the murders, as a lot of these murderers have done. Yeah, they have. You're right. He was released from the Ethan Allen Detention School for Boys on July 2nd, 1987, just before his 19th birthday, on July 7th, Mm -hmm. roughly three and a half years after he had committed the murders. During the period of his incarceration, he had appeared before the judge each year to determine if he were rehabilitated and ready to be released. Oh, that must be a difference in the Wisconsin courts. Mm -hmm. That they appear before the judge every year must be a requirement. Yeah, I thought that was a little unusual. But obviously he wasn't found to be rehabilitated any of those years. Um, So at his last hearing, the one where he was turning 18 and realistically could have been released, the judge said he still presents a danger to the community and needs confinement. So they knew exactly who they had in that reform school. Yeah, they knew that he wasn't done being a menace to society. Mm -hmm. The judge ordered him held until the very last minute possible. Remember, after this, he couldn't be held solely based upon the fact that he'd reached the age of majority. I can see why people struggle with the law and trying to get that kind of fine-tuned to take care of kids specifically. Yeah, because you don't want to be too harsh on them, but you don't want to be forced to release them when they haven't rehabilitated. Yeah. So you said he was planning to fund his release with his dead family's money. Did that work for him? Because we have those Slayer laws. Well, they did have Slayer laws in Wisconsin at this time, but these laws had some technical problems because they hadn't foreseen this kind of issue. Mm. The lawmakers had forgotten to take a look at the juvenile laws when they made changes to the probate law, leaving a legal loophole. A boy who killed his parents and remained in the juvenile justice system could technically inherit from those parents he'd murdered. So there was a weakness in the law. Yeah, again, I think they don't really think of people under the age of 14 who can't be waived into adult court Mm -hmm. and the possibility that they'll kill anyone they could inherit from. Mm -hmm. So the Slayer laws at that time precluded only those who had been convicted of murders from inheriting. But Peter had them on a technicality. He had been found delinquent, not convicted, in the murders of his family, which was the most the juvenile courts could do, as we just discussed. Again, the juvenile courts have purposively chosen not to proclaim children guilty of crimes. As per probate law, that was not considered a conviction. And remember, the delinquency disappeared after he turned 19, But probate law has been altered and kids can't do that now. Oh, okay. So that's why he was saying he wasn't guilty. In his head, it disappeared. Which sounds like, again, as a 14-year-old, he'd put a lot of research and planning into this. Mm Mm-hmm. So luckily, Peter wasn't the only surviving heir. Uh, The Zimmers had quite a bit of family. And Peter's uncles contested his claim, alleging that Peter had feloniously and intentionally killed his parents, citing the language in the statute that would prohibit him from inheriting. They had a pretty good case, and it's quite likely they would have won at trial, but the parties mediated and came to an agreement that gave Peter a portion of the money, that which his parents had earmarked as his prior to the murders, so around $177,000, And the agreement gave the family some peace of mind and closure in the deaths. That was very generous of his family. Yeah, I think that they wanted to honor their late relatives and also wanted to keep Peter away from them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I could see that. Understandably, yeah. So they were convinced that Hans and Sally would still want Peter to make something of himself in the aftermath of the murders and that inheritance would be held in the trust per the agreement. This trust paid his rent, but he was required to live at that address, $100 a month in living expenses, and it paid for his college or vocational school training and required him to remain in school until 1992 or graduation, whichever came first. He was also required to sign an agreement banning him from traveling to or living in states where his relatives lived, So Wisconsin, Arizona, Illinois, and California. So Hmm. everywhere he's lived and everywhere he's talked about living. And he was also restrained from contacting them in the future. 
So it looks like he might have been harassing them. Yeah, I think so. Because they were more concerned about this boy being around them than I would expect. Mm -hmm. His uncle's wife had already pulled out of Wisconsin and he was working on moving the business. The crystals for radios business that they had. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and they were moving the business because they were afraid of Peter. A 14-year-old. Mm-hmm. This is not a typical 14-year-old somehow. No, they kind of saw him as diabolical. He must have been doing something. Yeah. But that was fine with Peter. It doesn't sound like he was interested in seeing them. The stipulation had to be presented to the judge, who accepted it, and the case was over. And this is when Peter started saying he didn't kill his parents, that he'd never been convicted of killing his parents. Mm. Even though he had, it was just in juvenile court. But it seemed like he turned 19, and once his record was sealed, he believed he was simply absolved of it all. It had never happened. Wow. That's disturbing, and I can see why people don't like them not adjudicating them as guilty when they're children, based on this. Yeah, this is a really compelling argument for finding them guilty, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's a typical child criminal, but there are others like him. Hmm. But back in Wisconsin, the public outcry was huge, and the lawmakers quickly went about revising their slayer laws to ensure murderers could not inherit from the very people they murdered. In 1988, Peter's case was cited to help win passage of a law precluding juvenile parasite offenders from inheriting from their victim's estate. Oh, yeah. I heard that they changed two different laws because of Peter Zimmer. Mm Mm-hmm. We talked about this a little in our last episode, but they also decided they needed to revise the Children's Code to ensure that young parasite offenders and other types of pint-sized murderers could be waived into adult court and therefore subjected to longer sentences if need be. Detractors complained about this change, noting that kids under the age of 12 may not have the mental capacity to recognize the seriousness of their action. Oh, so that frontal lobe stuff? Yeah, um, and I understand people under 12 are a little different. They don't understand cause and effect quite as much. Very young. Yeah, but... Legislators believed that, while they cannot be expected to react like adults, we certainly have the right to expect them to act like good humans. Young kids can appreciate the fact that their actions are ending a human life, which I agree with. I think that our only 8-year-old murderer did understand that shooting someone killed him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They understand cause and effect, at least to that degree. You're right. But this reminds me of Danny Petrick, who tried to say... At the tender age of 17, I didn't understand that people died when you shot them, even though I hunted deer. Yeah, I thought that his argument was very disingenuous. I did, too. But again, the rulemakers were working under an abundance of caution, or maybe naivete. They didn't want children to be incarcerated if they were too young, so they set the new age to be waived into adult court at 14 not realizing that Andrew Churchwell would soon be arriving through that same pipeline. Mm. If you want to know more about Andrew Churchwell, you're in luck. We covered his case in episode 15, Anarchy 101. Check it out. While Peter was in treatment at Ethan Allen, he caught the eye of a pretty 19-year-old volunteer named Belinda. They developed a relationship that continued after he was released from the reform school. But he did cheat on her. The first few weeks after his release were spent on the beaches of Florida meeting girls. And of him, she said he was charming. I was his princess. Source records indicate they had a daughter, Nicole, in 1988, a little over a year after he left Ethan Allen. I guess there had been some rumors about him getting her pregnant while he was incarcerated. Oh. Some people say they married, but some people say they didn't. We couldn't locate records to confirm a marriage or a divorce ever took place. And he left Belinda for a woman named Sarah. Sarah filed for divorce on February 4th, 1993, and it was finalized on May 4th of 1993, uncontested. 
they had one daughter, Kylie. So although source materials say he had two children, and Candy said he had two children, he actually had three children with three women, two daughters and a son. Oh, okay. In any case, Nicole grew up oblivious to her father's past crimes, but Joe appears to have drifted away from her sometime in 1999. After his divorce from Sarah, she kept her daughter away from Joe, warning the child that he was an evil, dangerous man. So Sarah was Kylie's mom? Yes. Okay. So it isn't clear if Leah, his next wife, is in the picture before he and Sarah divorce, but the uncontested divorce in a relationship with Joe says probably they were a thing. Mm Mm-hmm. We do know that source material say they met at a company picnic and he and Leah fell head over heels in love. Leah owned a home in Indiana, so they moved into Leah's place, married, and that's when he had his son, Aiden. Okay. Leah filed for divorce on March 9th, 2004. Leah wasn't aware of Joe's little murder secret until around 2004. Five. She lived with him, had children with him, and divorced him, almost completely divorced him, before she found out about the murders. That's crazy, especially given they were together for like 10 years. Yes, I think it's insane, and I can't imagine what being married to him was like. Yeah. He was reportedly always full of ugly surprises in every relationship, and this divorce wasn't finalized until December 14th of 2005. Now, remember, he met Candy in the summer of 2005. Oh, okay. So he made it difficult even though he'd already moved on. Sort of had moved on. Because remember, he was going back and sleeping with Leah and trying to reconcile with her while he was engaged to Candy. Oh, I guess that's true. Joe had all but abandoned his relationship with Nicole. But at some point, he must have voiced his remorse over this to Candy once they got together because she had encouraged him to rekindle that relationship, and he did. Getting the chance to know her dad and see him getting his life on track and settle down made Nicole happy. She said she loved her dad, and when she did learn of what he'd done in his past, she had very mixed feelings about everything. But she still has a relationship with him now, so I'm assuming that Nicole decided he was a pretty good dad. Okay, well, at least he had some redeeming qualities. I think everyone has redeeming qualities. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to look a little harder. Candy had worked to help Joe establish a good life and repair his past relationships. But it wasn't what Joe had done as a child that left him alone in this world. It was his pattern of self-serving lies and betrayals in the present tense. Here's what Candy has to say about Joe according to Murderpedia. He's a compulsive liar. He had no remorse. It's all about Joe. That sounds about right. Mm Mm-hmm. Joe just wasn't as worried about Candy's happiness and well-being as she was his. With Candy, he was always telling her lies and coming up with new ugly surprises. He just couldn't seem to settle into an adult, committed relationship despite their being engaged. He cheated on her several times, and he didn't seem to care if she found out. He was confident he could always win her back. He was very charming and attentive, and he knew that flowers and gifts helped an apology along. He made a lot of those. He seemed motivated to keep Candy in a relationship with him, but he wasn't very motivated to be in that relationship himself. Yeah, he was not showing up for her, but he sure didn't want her to move on. Mm Mm-hmm. You've already heard about that stalking conviction after his breakup with Candy when he was 40 years old. He was convicted and spent the next two years and four months in the Blackwater River Correctional Facility in Florida. He informed the corrections officials of his plans to reside in San Diego, California on his release, which I guess that's typical for them to want to keep track of where the ex-convicts are going. Mm -hmm. But he didn't end up in California he wound up living somewhere else, Galveston, Texas, with Sarah Collier Zavadil. 
Wow. His ex-wife? Mm-hmm. The woman he divorced back in 1993. How did Kylie feel about that? Because it sounds like Sarah had told her that her father was a dangerous man. You're right. Sarah had told her he was a dangerous and evil man. And Kylie didn't know him at all. She'd actually kept Kylie from him for her entire childhood. And now Kylie's a grown-up. And Kylie was not happy that he was there. Yeah, understandably. Joe insisted that he just dropped in for a visit on his way to California. But it looked more like a permanent stay since he'd gone to the trouble of procuring a Texas driver's license with Sarah's address listed as his home address. And Sarah really seemed to still like him. He didn't really look as if he were going anywhere soon. And Kylie, who was now 23 and not living with her mother, decided to build a campaign to get him out of her mother's life. Mm -hmm. She went to the media because she couldn't convince her mom to make him leave. She was hoping that if her mom could see how many people were concerned about who this man was, she would finally listen to Kylie and make Joe move. This appears to have caused a rift between mother and daughter, but Kylie was worried that Joe had some financial incentive driving his return into Sarah's life. Sarah was due for a fairly large inheritance, according to the Galveston County's Daily News. That sounds about like Joe. Mm-hmm. I think the surprise was Sarah. Anyway, upon reading the news report, Sarah's apartment manager evicted her due to her housing and an unauthorized occupant. They served him a notice of trespass at approximately 10 p.m., and at 11.30 that same evening, an hour and a half later, Joe advised the Galveston newspapers that he'd left and was now in California where he was supposed to be, relaxing on the beach. Sure he was. Mm -hmm. In the aftermath of it all, Sarah was left scrambling to find a new home. So again, chaos. Mm -hmm. She'd been evicted. Many of the readers commented on this article, saying they doubted, just like you, that he'd really left Texas, and that the police somewhere would be dealing with this man again. And they were correct on both counts. How do we know that? Well, first, he found employment in Waco. He always worked in construction. Oh, like Fixer Upper. Yeah, but I'm sure Magnolia Farms wanted nothing to do with him. Yeah, probably not. And then there were the misdemeanor harassment charges from the three women who lived in Waco, Texas. Again? What happened? Well, it all started innocently enough. He met a woman after moving to Waco fell head over heels in love, swept her off her feet, and got engaged. That sounds familiar. Mm Mm-hmm. It's kind of his pattern, right? Sure looks like it. Then he started dating another woman, so there's that other part of the pattern. Mm Mm-hmm. Her name was Shannon O'Neill, and she also lived in town. He forgot to tell the two women about each other, which is also part of his pattern. Mm -hmm. Both relationships were extremely intense and involved, but the second one seemed to be on again, off again, which I think might indicate that Shannon was seeing something was wrong, Mm -hmm. but really liked him. Yeah. When Shannon realized he was actually engaged to another woman, though, she did the right thing. She dumped him. That was smart of her. Mm -hmm. There was a third woman who was party to the harassment charges. It was a friend to the fiancé. Joe would come to harass her, trying to get her to join him in his cause when his fiancé eventually breaks things off with him. That wasn't going to happen. This friend refused to help. She would never liked him in the first place, but had kept quiet about it because her friend really seemed to like him a lot. But she was glad they'd broken up. She was a good friend. Yeah. But there was yet another woman. It was a third woman that he pursued, but she wasn't filing charges. She was just willing to testify against him. She had pretty much friend-zoned him early in the relationship. She briefly loaned him her iPad, and when she got it back... She noticed he jumped on Match.com to set up dates with five different women. That's insane. I know. He already had two women in relationships with him. Mm -hmm. How many women does he think he can date at once? Apparently, he's very good at it. 
and he also used an email to write almost identical messages to these two separate women that he was seeing or mm-hmm. not seeing because they'd broken up with him, telling them both how much he loved them and how sincerely he wanted them back. That's crazy. I know. Everywhere he goes, it's chaos with the women. Mm-hmm. But let's fast forward a little to an evening after work. A couple of girlfriends got together to relax and have a glass of wine. They turned on the television for the first episode of this cool new show called I Dated a Psycho. And there he was. The man who was engaged to their office mate. The show chronicled the murder of the Zimmer family as well as telling everything that had happened afterwards, including the courtship and subsequent stalking and harassment of Candy Williams. At first, they giggled with recognition as they watched the depictions of Joe being the perfect boyfriend, despite the chaos that seemed to follow him around. He was such a confusing man. The feel of that living room became more concerned than amused as the story unfolded before their eyes. How in the world were they going to keep their friends safe? Terrified at what they learned, they contacted the local police. We watched that show. We did, and I would have died if I thought my friend was dating him. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a cheesy show, but his story was genuinely scary. Mm Mm-hmm, it was. And I think what I learned in kind of watching that show and doing this research is Joe really didn't sell love. Mm -hmm. Joe was selling hope. I think most women who end up tangled up in these relationships... Mm -hmm. They're tangled up in the hope that this man is who he's saying who he is. Apparently, hope is very powerful to these men who can't be honest with the women they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it makes sense because he would be really nice at the beginning, and then it was a constant chaos machine, but the women were always remembering how nice it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. He really invested a lot in the beginning of that. I remember people used to talk about relationships were like a bank. Mm -hmm. And if you invest a lot, then when things are bad, there's money in the bank. You can Mm -hmm. live off of it. And I think he did that quite a bit. Yeah. So what happened after those women called the police? Well, the police approached Shannon, the second woman in this Texas story, Mm -hmm. on June 23rd to apprise her of how dangerous Joe was. They were very concerned that he was out there playing women and then stalking women and that he had a history of murder. And they wanted Shannon to be aware and alert, and most importantly, to actively rebuff his efforts to connect with her. At first, she wondered if this were someone's idea of a joke, but the seriousness of the situation settled around her like a shroud. As Sheriff McNamara laid out all of the evidence she realized she had barely dodged a bullet with this man. He had effectively convinced her to tell him to never contact her again. Then Sheriff McNamara went to visit Joe's fiance, and did it again. Both women asked Joe to stop all communication with them, and Joe, in effect, said, Hold my beer. (laughs) True to form, he disappeared and started harassing his women. He flooded them with messages in an effort to get them back. And that's when he started harassing his ex fiance's friend in hopes that she would help him in his quest. The next Saturday, July 5th, 2014, Shannon, who was in league with the sheriff's office, relented. She told Joe she'd been thinking about what he said and she wanted to get together and try to work things out. Joe jumped at the opportunity and offered to meet her at Cantina, Texas. And that is exactly where the deputies overtook him. Instead of finding himself getting intimate with the woman he'd intimidated, he found himself intimate with the Cantina's patio floor as the deputies handcuffed him and hauled him to jail. As he lay helpless and cuffed on the ground, Miss O'Neill triumphantly proclaimed, You messed with the wrong girls. (laughs) That's better than Charlie's Angels. It is. So this unnamed friend said he stalked that woman in Florida, and he was doing the exact same thing here. He kept saying he wanted a second chance, 
He has had about 2,000 second chances. A man who cannot take no for an answer is someone to be feared, and he cannot take no for an answer. She's right. That is really scary. Mm hmm. I think it's terrifying. Mm hmm. Two weeks later, on July 18th, Joe paid his bond, just like last time, and walked away from the McLennan County Jail. But this time, he didn't leave without an ankle monitor. He insisted he hadn't threatened anyone. He'd only intended to annoy and embarrass them all. Oh, that's so much better. Oh, yes. He contacted the Tribune Herald, because he contacted the newspapers a lot, to let them know of his plans. He knew how his ankle monitor worked, but he couldn't resist lying. He told them he was heading to Fort Smith. No, no, Escondido, California. Wait. He meant, he meant Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, no, no, he was already in Escondido. Yeah, he was in Escondido, California, because he really just needed to get away from it all. He even sent them a fake picture to prove that he was in Escondido, but his ankle monitor indicated he had headed directly to Houston from Texas after bailing out, and he just stayed there. He'd contacted the Tribune Herald for attention, I guess. He wanted to let them know he hadn't murdered his parents all those years ago. He knew who did, and he would reveal their name in the book he planned to write. He also wanted to start claiming his parents were abusive. This claim was quickly refuted by the primary investigator from all those years ago. He said he found no evidence to support any of Peter's abuse claims in the evidence in the home or in any of his investigative interviews. Peter, or Joe, whichever one you liked to call him, mm -hmm. really liked to lie, and he depended on his lies working. Joe didn't want to discuss the pending harassment charges with the newspapers, but he felt it helped his case greatly to mention to them that he already had a girlfriend in another city when he was arrested on July 5th. As if a new girlfriend had ever meant he'd moved on from the old one. Exactly. Then he figuratively pulled out a hanky and cried about how misunderstood he had been over the years. Everything he did was simply misconstrued. He thought the dead piglet would be a fun surprise for Candy. She could use it in her second grade classroom to teach about science, yeah, right? Yeah, because second graders love dead pigs. Right, and dissecting pigs, right? Mm-hmm. Well, women constantly misconstrued everything he said and did, according to him. The stalking and harassment charges, they just weren't true. He never did anything wrong, and he had deeply and sincerely loved his fiancée. He had no idea why this new fiancée would desert him like this. <laughs> I think that we all have a few ideas. <laughs> I do. It looks like Joe was then charged with separate charges of harassment in McLennan County, Texas on June 13th, 2014, June 19th, 2014, June 27th, 2014, July 5th, 2014, and April 13th, 2015. That sounds like a lot. I know they were all electronic harassment, which was very different than what Candy experienced. Yeah, it was not quite as intense, but that's a lot of harassment. Well, I like that these authorities were right on top of it. Me they, too. They wanted him out of their town. Yeah, I think that's important. According to the Waco Tribune Herald, he cut a deal with the prosecutors, wherein he would be sentenced to 30 days in jail for each of the, cl for each of the three Class B misdemeanor counts, one charge for each woman. He would be given credit for time served, those two weeks back in July of 2014. That's it? Mm-hmm. Meaning he would not have to serve any more time. Hmm. In addition, he was required to remove himself to California and sign three lifetime restraining orders promising to never again contact or harass directly or indirectly the three women who helped in his Texas arrest. And he would get out of Waco, Texas and stay out. This man was thrown out of a lot of places. Mm hmm He's running out of places he's allowed to be. But the two women he duped in Texas wanted to confront him in court. But in the end, they both realized that, like most relationships that have ended, there was really nothing left to say. 
Makes sense. Yeah, there was one last pressing matter for him to attend to. He wanted that ankle bracelet removed. <laughs> he didn't like that it had been keeping tabs on his location ever since he'd been released from prison in Florida. But the judge said he had to wear it until they were sure he'd actually made it to California this time. You know, because you really can't trust a liar. So, this is quite a story. Do you know where he is now? Well, it looks like he's currently in a relationship, still has a relationship with his daughter, Nicole, mm -hmm. as well as at least one of his ex-wives. Oh, okay. So, it's interesting that he can commit such egregious acts and still end up friends and kind of family with people. Yeah, he must be extremely charming. Mm -hmm. I'm probably pretty nice to people when they're getting along. Yeah. It sounds like he may have finally made it to Escondido, California. <laughs> is that where it says he is now? It looks like it. Okay. Well, that's it for today. We'd like to thank the Portage Daily Register, Murderpedia, the Tampa Bay Times, the folks at the Dream and Demon, the Daily Mail, the New York Daily News, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, the AP News, JoJo Stories, Adam Quick, Criminally Listed, Bruce Filmetti of the Journal Sentinel, the Des Moines Register, the Waco Tribune, the Wisconsin State Journal, the Capital Times, and the Galveston County Daily News for the information and pictures that we used in the story today. We'd also like to thank Jade Brown for the music. If you are able, please help support our show with a pledge through patreon.com slash parasite podcast. Your tax-deductible donations go directly toward research to prevent future parasites. Thank you for your support. We will see you next week for a very special Thanksgiving episode. Have a good week. I can't wait. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. <laughs>